Hello, everybody. Um, sorry, this is a bit loud. So, hello, everybody. My name is Jamie Coleman. Thank you for having me in Bulgaria. This is the first time I've been to this country, and um, it's an amazing, beautiful place. Uh, I'm from IBM. I'm a subject matter expert generally in containerization and technologies, Kubernetes, all those good things. And today I want to talk to you about how you can kind of utilize container technologies to replicate what you have in production locally on your machine. So let's get started. I do have a demo in here today. Um, whether or not it'll work out, we will see. Conference Wi-Fi always is a bit weird, but the Wi-Fi seems to be quite good here. So first of all, we're going to talk about how kind of containers begun, a little bit of history around that. Um, then we're going to talk about the problems we are trying to solve with containers, why they exist. Um, then I'm going to talk about the problems testing with containers can solve. Then I'll talk a little bit about test containers. Um, hands up, who's heard of test containers or used it before? OK, we've got a few people. OK, brilliant. Um, then I'm going to move on to talking about microshed testing, which is a framework which can help simplify test containers. Then I'm going to talk about how Open Liberty works with microshed testing. And then again, hopefully an interactive demo and then an overview with some links to some of the material. All right, so in the beginning, we had, well, not quite the beginning, but before I was born, so I'll class it as the beginning, we had Unix v7. So this was really the first kind of technology that helped pave the way to what we have today with containers. So this was kind of introduced, the CH root system call, um, and this changed the root directory of processes and its children to new locations in the file system. So this was in 1979, so quite a while ago. Um, after that, we had something called C groups. So this was, give, which was mainly created by Google, um, and what this allowed was basic, it allowed basically to um, basically isolate resources on your Linux machine, so CPU, network, uh, memory input and output, etc., cetera, um, into specific parts of the underlying kernel. Then after this, we had in 2008 something called LXC, or Linux X containers. And this was really the first most complete containerization technology that was out there. Um, many of you have probably not heard of it. I never used it myself. Um, but what this did was essentially allowed you to use the C groups that was donated by Google and created by them um, and utilize that to kind of isolate resources on the underlying kernel. So then we move on to 2013. And I don't know if Docker realizes the impact they had on the world. But in 2013, Docker basically created an amazing tool which made it very easy and simple to create containers using a command line interface. Um, so before Docker, it really wasn't a technology people were considering, um, but Docker really took it into the modern age and basically created something that makes it very easy to use containers technology. And then in 2014, we had Kubernetes, because then we started realizing that containers, as great as they are, when you've got hundreds of these things, manage them can be very difficult. Kubernet uh, Google saw this. They were the biggest contributor to Kubernetes. And they gave this to the community to basically help them manage containers. So we refer to Kubernetes as a container orchestrator. So that's a little bit about the history of containers, how it started, where it came to. Um, now I'm going to f we're going to talk about the magic that containers provides us as developers. So first of all, virtualization from an OS level, um, lightweight, really fast startup if you compare it to, say, virtual machines. Um, and the main thing I want you to take away here is the portable aspects. It, the reason containers are portable, and we really need to utilize them as much as possible. So portable, you can use uh, easy to configure using a Docker file. The kind of idea is that they'll run anywhere, providing the architecture underneath is supported. But generally, containers support most architectures these days. Um, again, back to isolation, having these things running in isolation on the same OS um, without any effort from us developers to do that. And complexity. Now, they do provide complexity, and they do make things a little bit more complex. But I don't think that's containers' fault. I think that's the architecture we as developers are choosing to use nowadays. I think with microservices, when you're breaking apart a big application, having loads of little applications, you're going to get more complexity. So I don't think it's the container's fault that we have extra complexity these days. I think that's more the architectures we're using. 
So what does the magic of Kubernetes provide? Well, again, like I mentioned, containers can get a bit difficult to manage, especially when you've got hundreds or possibly thousands of them, depending on your organization. So Kubernetes allows us to essentially have automated rollouts and rollbacks. Um, so we can easily update our applications. Um, automatic scaling, so if we, we have all of a sudden loads of customers trying to access our applications, Kubernetes can scale that up for us so we don't have to worry too much about it. Um, health monitoring, now I know you've got the startup probe, you've got the liveliness probe, you've got the readiness probe, I think there's possibly another probe that Kubernetes released, but all these things together help us manage our containers and make sure they're healthy because there's no point standing up applications that no one can access. Um, declarative management, so using um, YAML, which is probably not everyone's favorite thing to use, but using that to kind of describe what your deployments are doing and your services. And like I mentioned, deploy anywhere. The whole idea, you'll be, it'll be difficult if you can find me a cloud provider that does not support Kubernetes or has a Kubernetes option. So the hope is that you can build your application and you could take it to the Azure cloud, you could take it to the IBM cloud, you take it to the AWS cloud, and it should run the same way. So those are some of the uh, things that Kubernetes helps provide us as developers. So what magic can we use from this containerized ASIN and these technologies? So like I mentioned, isolated development environments. So as a developer, um, say 20 years ago, I would have to download all the prereqs, I'd have to get the right database, I'd have to populate that database, and I'd have to have all this stuff on my local machine. Whereas containers, we don't need to do that anymore. We can create these things very simply and throw them away afterwards. So again, kind of feeds into the isolation part of things. Portable, like I mentioned, I can take my container, my image, I can give it to a colleague, they can test it, they can play around with it. So it makes it easy to share our microservices and our applications between teams. Um, there's loads of pre-configured images out there. Um, there's lots of different uh, container registries. The most known one is probably Docker Hub, but there are lots and lots of them out there. So we can simply pull down the image, the runtime, have it all kind of pre-configured, and a lot of the time just throw our application in there and it should work. So having these stuff ready to go from a central place is amazing. Um, fast startup of applications if you're comparing it to things like virtual machines so we can test things very quickly. Um, Again, like I mentioned, no need to have prereqs installed. We can install all of those in our container. You have version control, so um, essentially we can say stay on this certain version of an image rather than going up to the latest, or we can just move up to the latest depending on what we want to do. Um, and we can develop easily in the cloud. So I'm going to show you later on in my demo. As part of that, I'm going to use a learning environment like we created in the cloud, which is all running on containers. And I'm talking you have your IDE, you have your Kubernetes cluster, um, you have your JVM. Everything you need is all built into this one container that you can just hit with a web browser and do, develop your code. Um, and then true to production testing, which is what this talk is about. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about, about that later on. So we go back to the beginning. In the beginning, we had the application, because I guarantee you, we didn't test first. <laughs> Most developers, they build their application, and then they test it later, um, which can lead to lots of problems. But problems with testing that containers can solve. So data access, such as databases. If we're using containers in production, in our organization, there is no reason we shouldn't be able to take those containers, those images, and put them on our laptop locally and utilize them. We all, if you're using them in production, you probably have a container registry somewhere that your organization is using to pull those images down and to deploy them. So why we as developers, why can't we utilize that? And that's kind of what I'm trying to get at here with my talk and show you how easy that is to do. Um, integration testing. Um, containers make this a lot easier. We can spin up lots and lots of things on a local machine or on a cloud, et cetera, and we can test the interactions between them. Um, automatic updating and version control, like I mentioned in the previous slide. Again, no complex setup on machines. The amount of times that something's failed because you've got the wrong Maven version, you're using the wrong version of the JVM, so you're using 11 when you're using features in, say, 17 or 18. You can forego all of those problems when you're using containers and just have everything pre-configured and portable testing. So I can test stuff locally and then hand it to a colleague. He can make some changes. He can then run the same test locally. So having it portable makes it very simple for teams to collaborate and work on code together. So enough about the history of containers and things like that. Now let's get on to testing with containers. So Test Containers was created in 2015. Um, like if you're using, so, okay, another question. How many people are using containers in production in their organization here? 
Okay, not as many as a four, but still quite a few. Okay, so if you are using containers in production, you really, really need to look at this technology. So Test Containers is an open source um, framework, which is basically designed to help you as a developer kind of bridge the gap between production and development parity. So essentially, close that gap. Because the problem is, you test stuff on your local machine. You send it off to be tested by your infrastructure, and it's going to fail. And then it comes back. You have to make changes back and forward, back and forward, until it passes all the tests, and it works. But there's no need for that anymore with containers, especially when we can replicate these things locally um, on our machines. So this is what kind of test containers helps with. So there was problems at the beginning, and there was probably a reason why Test Containers was created in 2015 rather than earlier, um, is because containers had limitations at the beginning. So they were really not designed for testing purposes. They were really designed to you know, build your application and then deploy it somewhere. Um, for example, we didn't really have graphical user interface support when, we first start, when containers first became a thing. Um, and there wasn't also support for certain operating systems. I know Windows didn't have support at the beginning. Um, Mac didn't have support at the beginning. But that's all changed now. Um, pretty much any kind of OS, architecture, and even graphical user interfaces are all supported by containers. So now let's get on to test containers. So test containers is pretty amazing. Um, I use this all the time at work. Um, it's basically a Java library that provides very lightweight, throwaway instances um, of anything that can pretty much runs in a Docker container and supports JUnit. And the demo I'm going to give you today is I'm going to basically take a very, very basic JUnit test and show you how quickly you can turn it into a microshed test and run that. So test containers uh, makes testing easier in a lot of different ways. So data access layers integration test, um, it means rather than us having a big database on our laptop, we can then pull from our organization's registry their populated database and test against that, rather than trying to mimic that or copy that locally. Um, application integration tests, so test containers supports this. You can spin up lots and lots of containers with um, test containers and test all these things together. So I was using Postgres the other day, connecting it to about four different microservices, and that probably took me about 10 minutes to write the code to do that. Um, it also supports UI acceptance tests, so we can do the graphical user interface side of stuff. Um, there's loads of different modules contributed by lots of different organizations, um, so go check that out. And it supports pretty much any kind of JUnit 5, JUnit 4, and um, Spock testing. OK, so browser testing. So like I mentioned in the beginning, containers didn't really have much support for graphical user interfaces, but that's changed now. So what test containers can do is it can give you the ability to do user interface acceptance testing. Um, in a container, it'll give you a fresh instance of the browser every time. Um, there's no browser state or variations or browser upgrades. And it can even do a video recording of the actual test. Or you can say, I just want it if it fails, because you don't really want a big video recording every time you run your test. Um, some of these are some of the test, con test container modules. So you've got lots of different database ones, Couch, uh, Couchbase, DB2, MongoDB, et cetera. And then there's other modules. So it also supports things like Docker Compose, Elasticsearch. There is Kafka modules, Nginx, RabbitMQ. Um, the list is quite large, and it's growing rapidly. Um, so do check out the different modules, because I guarantee there'll be technologies that have been contributed to this that you'll be using. And it's not just me. Um, a lot of these quotes were taken from about a year ago. Um, but every time I, I, I do follow test containers, obviously. Um, but people are always raving on about how amazing this technology is. And on top of that, they're very surprised how easy it is to get started with it and then the benefits when they start using it. So like I said, if you are using containers in production in your organization, please do take a look at this technology, because it is very powerful. I can help simplify. Um, your life as a developer, it can help get rid of the fact that you might keep going back and forth between your testing infrastructure to get the code working. Um, this can eliminate a lot of that. Not all of it, don't get me wrong, there's always going to be problems, but it can help reduce the amount of times you have to then go back to your code and try and fix something that's picked up in the testing stage um, of your DevOps pipeline. So this is a very basic test containers example. Um, so this is just simply standing up two containers. Uh, one's a Postgres container, and the other one is an Open Liberty container. And all I'm doing here is I'm essentially um, I'm basically attaching a network, because when you spin up containers, they're isolated. So I need to put them on the same network. Um, I'm exposing the right ports. Um, I'm adding a log4j um, logger. It is on the right version. Don't worry, there's no vulnerabilities in that one. Um, 
and essentially, same thing with the Open Liberty container, just setting it up, putting it on the same network. Um, and then, as you can see here, it says waiting for, wait for um, HTTP. That's essentially a health check. So it allows us, because if I, test containers doesn't know about my application, it doesn't know when to start talking to it. So Open Liberty provides a way for you to run health checks. This is using MicroProfile. And this essentially allows test containers to check this endpoint. And when it gets an OK, then it will start running the tests against it. So the, the problem with test containers, and I'm going to show you an example of some code now, um, it can be a bit confusing to get started with. Uh, do, do, do. So let me just open that. So again, this is the code I used before. Ignore the tags. That's documentation stuff. Um, but very simple, setting up two containers there. Um, again, just a load of static variables. But then we had, for this, I had to go and create something called the Liberty container. And what this class does, it essentially does things like sets up the logger. Um, this is the message I'm waiting for to say um, the application server's running, not the actual health of the application, but just the actual runtime itself. Um, then we have to use a REST client. I think I was using REST Easy here. Yep, REST Easy client. Um, then we have to do stuff like get the base URL, et cetera. So this can be a little bit daunting to start with. Um, but that is where microshed testing comes in, and this is what I'm going to show you next. So microshed testing is a framework that utilizes test containers but makes a lot of this setup a lot simpler. For example, I don't, with test containers, I have to pre-build my image. I have to get a Docker file. I have to build, say, my Open Liberty image, and then put that in my local registry on my computer. And then test containers will pull that and start testing against it. Whereas microshed testing will take care of a lot of that for you. I don't have to set up ports. Um, I don't have to set up the REST client. I don't have to set up pulling down the image. It'll automatically pull down the latest image for me. But if there is a Docker file there, it will utilize that rather than doing stuff automatically. So what is microshed testing? So like I mentioned, it's a framework. And basically, what it tries to do is get your production and development environments as close to one another as possible. Um, and it basically simplifies a lot of the setup process, a lot of the code you need to do to achieve that. Um, so this is an example of some microshared testing code. Um, again, all you need is the annotation at the top of your test class. So imagine this was a JUnit test, and I've just added microshared test at the top. That tells Maven or Gradle, OK, this is a microshared test. Treat it as so. Um, the container, very simple. I've just got the app context root. So that would be the URL that I'd access my app with. And then you can add stuff like um, the health check underneath there. Then I've got my REST client to test against, and then just my normal test. So there aren't really that many additional things that are here over a normal JUnit test to get started. Um, and you can also use shareable configurations. So I might not want to put the configuration to set up my container in every one of my test classes. So you can put your configuration in a, another class and then just call that with an annotation to basically utilize that so you don't have to keep repeating the same configuration every time. Uh, there are different runtimes available. So you can use this with Open Liberty. You can use this with Pyara. You can do, use this with Wildfly. You can use this with Quarkus. And again, it just makes the setup and getting started process of this a lot simpler. Um, I originally started using microshed testing. And I was told about a month ago to get all this running with test containers, just vanilla, plain test containers. Problem with that is I, I didn't really know where to get started. Um, there was a bit of the documentation that was a bit confusing. So what I ended up doing is going through the microshed testing framework and unengineering it and then pulling the code out, changing the code to basically get it running with test containers. So if you, do, if you just want to use the vanilla stuff, you can just go to the microshed testing um, uh, framework and look in the code there and pull the code out you need if you just want to use plain um, test containers. So Open Liberty and microshow testing. So hands up here. Who knows about what Open Liberty is? Anybody? OK, we've got like three or four people. OK, so I, Open Liberty, um, this was originally called Websphere Liberty. And this, was IBM, this is IBM's open source um, cloud native runtime. Um, it's been around, we open sourced it about five years ago. I think this was with the IBM Java. And it was IBM's biggest open source contribution in history. I think it was something like 10 million lines of code, which was crazy. Um, took a lot of haggling with um, the sales side of our organization to get this open source, because they were scratching their heads saying, well, where are you going to make your money? But we did it in the end. Um, it took a lot of fighting as developers. But Open Liberty works really great with microshed testing. So there's something called dev mode, which allows you to essentially start the runtime and forget about it. 
So it means I can start the runtime, get it configured how I want. Then I don't need to care about every time I change a bit of my codes, restarting the runtime. If I change a bit of configuration, I don't have to care about that. Um, and if I make changes to my test code, I don't have to care about start restarting the server. Um, of course, when you make changes to the test code, it doesn't run through the whole testing cycle every time, because that could get a bit annoying if you're changing one variable. Um, but all you need to do is go back to your, it'll say um, test code compiles. You just go back to your terminal, hit enter, and it'll cycle through your testing. And it works really well in MicroShed testing. And I'll demonstrate to you how quickly MicroShed can spin up these containers and run these tests um, just by hitting enter in your terminal. Um, OK, so that's basically the output that you'll get. If you can see in there, it's exposed ports. It started the containers up in one millisecond. So this is a container with Open Liberty inside with our test code. It started that up in one second, runs its tests against it, and then shuts back down. So it means you as a developer don't have to clutter your laptop with lots of different prereqs and things like that. Everything will just be provided in the container, which you can just throw away afterwards. So very simple to get started with MicroShed testing and test containers, to be fair. Um, you only need a couple of Maven dependencies to put into your POM file. Um, there aren't many imports you need to add to your code, so very quickly to get started. Um, so what I'm going to try and do now is I'm going to try and do an interactive demo on this online learning environment, which is using containers, um, to show you how quickly I can turn a JUnit test into a MicroShed test. So let's pray to the demo gods, and hopefully this is going to work. OK, so if you want, you are welcome to try this out for yourself. This is an open learning environment for everybody. Um, if you go to the Open Liberty website, which is here, and as you've never seen Open Liberty, this might be beneficial, um, you can go to the Open Liberty website, and we have some great documentation on here, but we also have tons of guides. Um, we are kind of vendor neutral. We don't favor IBM at all. We've got guides on AWS. We've got guides on Azure. I recently just did a video series deploying this to all the different clouds and linking them all together. So do check this out, because there are guides on, as you can see, loads of different technologies um, to get started. But if you just go to here and write MicroShed, this is the one we're going to run. And up here, there's a button called Running Cloud. Now, I've already opened this. It'll take you to this page. And then um, once you've logged in, it will take you to this environment. So this is the learning environment we've been creating. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see your IDE. And that basically is a fully-fledged IDE that's all running in a container that has access to Kubernetes, that has access to um, Docker. It has the JVM installed in there, um, pretty much everything you need. And this is all running on the cloud. Um, in a container. So when I logged in, this essentially started up a container and set all this stuff up for me. Um, you've got your terminal down here, so everything you need to do is down there. On the left-hand side, we have our instructions. Um, a lot of our guides are using this nowadays, so it's quite easy to get started. And one of the main reasons we started doing this was, and it was actually pre-pandemic, pre-COVID, um, I would rock up to workshops all over the world, and people would have the wrong version of Maven, which would cause me problems. And I would spend probably about 30 minutes trying to debug everyone's laptops to figure out why this stuff wasn't working when it was working on mine. Um, whereas this environment gives me everything I need, puts everyone at the same starting point, so you can have the experience with the technology that you, you need rather than you know, trying to set stuff up. So let me get started here. So first of all, um, it's very simple. You can literally just click this, and it will execute it straight to your uh, terminal. Um, I'm not going to try what I build. And I'm going to go straight to actually basically creating the uh, test. So here is our code. If we go into start, so what I'm going to do first, actually, I'm going to start Liberty in dev mode. So just make sure I'm in the right directory. Yep. And then we'll start Liberty in dev mode. So the first time I'm starting this up, like I said, this is a clean environment. It's going to have to download dependencies from Maven, like the runtime, et cetera. Um, but once this is done, it will start up very, very quickly afterwards. Um, so while that's doing that, let's go and have a look at, at what our tests are going to be. So if I open this, this is our test class here. Let me just make that a bit bigger. So there's nothing in there um, that very, again, very basic. Um, testing class, we need to add some stuff in there. But what I want to show you is how quickly I can turn this, which is basically a JUnit testing class, into using MicroShed testing. So first of all, I'm going to copy the first bit of code and then explain what I've done. So all we've done is add the imports here. I've annotated the top of my test class with at MicroShed test. So Maven or Gradle or whatever build tool you're using knows that that's a MicroShed test. 
Um, the at rest client is the rest client, or basically the application I'm going to test against, which is a person service. It basically stores information about people, etc. Um, and this is the container I've got. So I'm using the import from the application container, which is a pre-setup thing by MicroShed testing. Uh, like I mentioned before, you can do this without MicroShed testing, but you'll have to basically create the container class yourself. So a bit of extra work is involved. Um, the context root is essentially the location I access my application with, and these are the health checks. So um, basically, I'm looking with a readiness probe for uh, forward slash health, forward slash ready. And what this will do is once the runtime has started up, um, before it starts running our tests in containers, it will check this and then get started. So let's see if we're ready to go. Get rid of that. Yep, so we should be all up and running. So Liberty's in dev mode now. Yep, excellent. OK, we're all good to go. So we should now be able to. That's saved, yep. So if I now, like I mentioned, it's good, now it's going to have to download the test containers stuff from Maven. But once this is done, it won't have to do this again, so don't worry. Um, and while that's doing that, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to test that my health check is working. So let me just open up a new terminal. Do, do, do. OK. Uh, see, it's starting up now. Cool. Um, I'm just going to run this just to make sure my application's happy. OK, so it's saying up. It means my application's happy. Everything's all good. So uh, do, do, do. let's basically make this test a bit more interesting. Um, let's add a test method. This environment will also, also automatically save stuff. So all I've added here is basically a very, very simple test to create a person called Hank, who's 42 years old. And if we go back to the terminal here, we should see that OpenLiberty figured that out. It knows that's run. And if I hit Enter, we should now hopefully demonstrate how quick MicroShed testing works. It's starting up the container in parallel. Again, you can use lots of containers at once if you want to do integration testing. It's going to run our tests, shut the container down, and we're done. So that was very simple how to do that. But let's make our test class a bit more interesting. Let's add some more test methods in. So let me copy this. And I just want to show you how quickly this is to do. All I'm doing here, just so you know, is just adding some more test methods in, um, just testing the minimum age, creating a person, the minimum size of the name, etc. So now, again, I can go back to my terminal. OpenLiberty is running dev mode. Hit Enter, and it's going to do the same thing. It's going to spin up my container. It's going to then run. Once it's got that endpoint of um, that it's healthy, it's going to run all my tests against it and then shut the container down. So I've basically taken an empty JUnit class here, turned it into a MicroShed test, which is pulling down the containers I need. I didn't pull down any of these containers beforehand. This is a completely blank environment. Um, and we've managed to create some tests and basically run those. And the demo gods are happy because they all worked. Um, you can test outside of dev mode. So if you just go, uh, so you can shut dev mode down, Control C. Um, you can test outside just by using Maven Verify. Um, I'll do that. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to show you um, basically how to make shareable configuration. And this is quite simple as well. Um, so first of all, I'm going to run this, this touch command. This will create a new file for me, so errorpath.it. Um, let me just copy this in, just some more basic tests. So this isn't the shared configuration part. The shared configuration part is here. So what we're going to do is create a new class. I'm going to open that. And we're going to copy in the shared configuration. And this configuration is basically what we started Oh, no, not the right one. Um, this configuration is basically what we started with in the first test class. So we've just moved the at container part into its own separate class. So now we can use that from other classes. So that's all saved, all good. Now I just need to update the person service IT class. All I'm really doing here is changing this. So adding this annotation at the top, which tells this test class to use this shared configuration. So let me just copy that into the right class. So again, the only difference here is this annotation and the addition of this. And then I'm just going to update the error class to do the same thing, to take the shared container configuration rather than having to specify it at the top of the actual class itself, which we've got here. OK, so now we have two test classes. We have our shared configuration. Now I'm going to go back to my terminal and then run Maven Verify. 
And hopefully, this will use the share configuration, and now we should see 10 tests passing rather than six. Do, 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 do. And the great thing is, like I said, with integration testing, this makes life really, really simple. So I use this with databases all the time, start up a load of microservices. They all talk to each other. You just have to put them on the same network. Um, and then you can talk to the databases. And basically, uh, we generally what we do is we store these databases, these images, in a shared registry in our organization. So when I, want to, when I create some new application code, I don't have to do anything. I have the Docker file on my local machine, which will point to this registry. So all I need to do is start my runtime, hit Enter. It will pull down the latest images that the part of my organization uses for production deployment, and then run them locally on my computer which basically helps me as a developer not have to worry that my code might break when it goes through the DevOps pipeline into the testing stages. So that's pretty much the whole part of the demo. I'm just going to go back to here. Um, but I'm just going to quickly show you. So if I compare this to just vanilla test containers, obviously, like I said, there's a lot of setup here that needs to be done. Um, but this is all done for you manually with microshare testing. So it makes life a lot, lot easier. Um, again, this is another, uh, I'm basically adding stuff to the database here. So this is just setting up two database, uh, database Postgres. Um, again, pulling that down. But again, with Microshed, I have to pull down the image manually. So I have to build this Postgres database. Whereas Microshed testing, if you say you want a Postgres database, it'll pull that down for you. And again, you can change that by having your Docker file um, basically point to a specific location to pull that down. Um, but all I'm doing here is, like I mentioned, basically creating a network, which I created at the top, put them on the same shared network, give them an alias, um, add a log4j logger, because if we don't have that, it's just going to complain. Um, and then, again, using the, the health check to basically check that it's, um, it's all ready and good to go. Right, let me just go back to my presentation. Right, so I seem to have got through this a bit quicker than expected, so you might all get a little break, um, but I'm just going to summarize here today. So in retrospective, containers are amazing. If you're not using them, try and use them as soon as possible. Don't get me wrong, they're not always the best fit for every kind of architecture style. Um, monoliths can always be a bit of a problem when putting them in containers. You do get benefits from it, but you do have disadvantages as well. Um, so containers are great in my opinion. I use them pretty much for everything. Um, they make developers' lives, I believe, a lot easier um, by being portable, easily to share, um, very easy to configure using the same kind of Docker file, et cetera, what we're using. Or you can use, again, the test containers works with Podman, it works with Rancher, it works with pretty much any kind of container um, technology that's out there. And it's also very lightweight. So as you could see, when I was testing, it was spinning up those containers in about a second. Um, or two seconds, and then it ran on my test very, very quickly and shut it down. So I don't have to worry about setting stuff up. Um, I think containers do sometimes make things a bit more complicated. So when we were all building monoliths with these big applications, I think life was a bit simpler in some ways. Um, but these things kind of don't fit into this cloud-native world where we're renting hardware rather than owning it. So we need the ability, the ability to scale nowadays. And I think that's what containers help with. Um, and like I mentioned, I don't think containers make life more complex for developers. I think it's more the architectures we're using nowadays. So rather than having a big application, having 100 applications. Um, but again, the, of course, there's benefits of using microservices, et cetera, or functions of a service just to make your life even more complicated. Um, they can help solve issues with dev prod parity, like I mentioned. So trying to get your production environment as close as possible to what you have locally on your local machine. Um, by essentially having these pre-set up images in this registry that you can pull down. Um, and they speed up time to production. So as, as, like I mentioned, as, as, as developers, we don't have to worry so much about the tests we ran on our local machine um, not covering enough of what our application needs to do, especially stuff like integration testing. So by mimicking what we have in production and bring it down locally, we can basically speed up the time. We get our code into production. So there's some links to a lot of different stuff here. Um, the top one is just the Open Liberty homepage. If you want to know more about microshed testing, again, there's the guide on there. Um, go to the microshed or test containers um, open source web pages. There's some loads of great informa uh, information there and documentation about how you get started. They have documentation on all the different databases, all the different runtimes. So it's all on there. And you will find examples in, in their GitHub pages. Um, ba -doo -doo -doo. Yep, so again, check out the Microshed testing guide. There is also um, 
at the, there is also, if you want to use a test container example, the bottom link there goes to like a deep dive on kind of how to use Open Liberty. And in there, I've basically created the code to use vanilla test containers as opposed to microshare testing if you really want to get down that, to that level. So, yeah, I hope you all kind of learned something today. I know some of you already know what test containers are, so I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. But um, the rest of you, if you are using containers in production and you've not tried or tested this technology before, do give it a go. Uh, and hopefully it will make your life a lot easier. It's not me, just me saying these things. Um, go on social media like Twitter, etc., and you'll see lots and lots of people saying how amazing this technology is. Um, so do try it out, and if anyone's got any more questions after this session, um, feel free to find me. I'm probably one of the only people in a purple top, although I can see a few people. Um, so do feel free to find me. I can point you to any examples, any documentation. Um, and again, not specific to Open Liberty, I can help you with different runtimes as well. Um, I'm very unbiased. So, yep, I hope you enjoyed my session, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>